Jeff, David, are you in there? Good morning, Jason. Good morning. We're ready to go in three, two, one. I am unbelievably excited about today's show. We are live on LinkedIn. We are live on YouTube, live on Periscope around the world. I have two of the most professional, most qualified, coolest people I know on the show to talk about education, hospitality, the industry, and their new project. She is a global culinary trendologist, the former executive chef for President's Choice, culinary director for CARA Operations, chair of George Brown College, director of culinary strategy for Maple Leaf Foods, and Really, she's the Meryl Streep of the of the hospitality world. If you want to, if you want to win an Oscar, this is your girl, ladies and gentlemen, Chef Christine Cavalier. Good morning, Chef. Wow, I want to do this every week if we get to have introductions like that. <laughs> Thank you for being here, and joining us today is Oh Captain, my Captain, my good friend, and this. Your accolades are just as long, <laughs> 38 years in education, vice president of ILAC, the largest language institute in Canada, head of education for Vancouver Premier College, 2010 named one of Canada's top principals, named one of the top U of UBC 100 as the top leaders in education, joining names like Rick Hansen, Justin Trudeau, he's even made the front page of the Globe and Mail, my friend David Durpat. Thank you, Jason. Thank you so much for joining me. You powerhouses have gotten together and, and uh, decided to change the world. You have a, a, a new project, uh, it's Culinary and Hospitality Leadership Consulting. Tell, tell me about it. You know, there was such a need for it in the industry. It's really a service for faculty, culinary and hospitality faculty um, around the world to, to teach, taste, uh, learn and inspire. And we're happy to, to guide them on the journey to their future. We just look, Jason, at both sides of, of the way culinary and hospitality schools work. And quite often, as we've discussed, is that uh, the faculty are just left and sometimes only get a 20 minute piece of information on how to improve. And, um, you know, try running, running your relationship by giving your wife, you know, 20 minutes of feedback once every year. It's just not the way to, to work with people you know and care about. So you realize I would get war and peace as a uh, <laughs> as <feedback. laughs> now to improve. <laughs> so it's an exciting opportunity for us. So you, we 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 had a little pre-show yesterday, and we talked about the different buckets that the, the the two of you are 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 bringing to institutes and bringing to the industry, and how and how your um, how your professional traits can help improve <coughs> improving. <laughs> So can we talk to talk about those, Chef? Absolutely. You know, when we think about setting up the next generation of culinary and hospitality professionals, there are those buckets. So let's start with teach. I am I am honored to to enter into this uh, project with an expert like Dave. And Dave and I have gotten to know each other. We work really well together. Um, we smile, we laugh, and we have fun. But when I think of the bucket of teach, I think of Dave. So let's start with Dave talking about all his tips and tricks on education and instruction uh, to culinary and hospitality faculty. So I, I use the example, Jason, I, I drive a Porsche and I, I don't take my Porsche to the local gas station to get the engine fixed. I take it to an expert. I hope my heart never goes, but if someone's going to take my heart out and fix it, I'd like to have an expert take it out, at least know, you know what it's about, and then put it back in. The right. same should happen with a school. You want to, you know, I think schools are fun, and, and if you can't have fun in a school, you shouldn't be in one. But at the same time, um, I think I'd like to take that research that mechanic would take to my car, or that research that doctor would take to someone's heart, and apply that to school. And so... What we've tried to do is take all of the research on enhancing learning and improving instruction and apply that to a school. Um, and that, you know, it's wonderful in the sense that many of these teachers have been left for 15 and 16 years without any input whatsoever. Right. And um, I find them so receptive to, uh, to input. Well, I know that when we worked together, we did a collaborative effort in, in bringing different minds in to 
uh, to both observe and to, to comment and to work together. I mean, that's, uh, that's something that I had never seen before and a lot of, and a lot of places I've never seen before. What are some other things that you're, that you're bringing as, a, as an approach to, to help people who are, who are chefs and, and have been coming in and teaching the same recipes for, uh, again, like you say, 16 to 20 years, but they're, they, they may be just showing them and not necessarily teaching them. Well, in many cases, chefs are trained to be chefs, but right. chefs aren't trained to be teachers, right. you know, and, and so in, in thinking about how to make the experience great for the faculty and how to make the experience great for the students that are there, we really have to think about how they're teaching and what they're teaching. Right. Even going back to the collaboration, Jason, is the power of collaboration is amazing in education. When you take two professional people and put them together and then give them the time to collaborate on everything from questioning to instruction to technology, um, it makes a huge difference, as you know, because you were a big part of that when we worked together. But beyond that, I think it's, um, as I said, applying all of the research, um, looking at technology. Uh, how, do you, you know, how do you incorporate technology into, um, into a classroom? Even simple things like um, embedding video, as well as how to use PowerPoint properly versus throwing it up on the screen and just reciting what everything's on there. Um, you know, there's so many ways that we can look at teaching as a science as well as an art and, uh, and look at ways we can improve it. And I mean, we, there's, there's, there's that, and then there's the relevance of, of, of the material as well. Uh, and uh, having ha ha that being your, your exact wheelhouse chef, um, how, how do you, how do you see that changing as far as, um, you know, we, we, we don't need to teach people how to make a terrine anymore because nobody eats it and nobody buys it and, right? Absolutely. So that sort of falls under our taste bucket. And you, you were so generous in, in telling all about my culinary journey. And, and one of the things I do now um, to clients I have in, on my culinary concierge company is I talk about taste. My, my trademark is taste, taste, taste. We're not making paper clips. We're in the food industry. So if you're a culinary student, you're there to taste. So you're right. Do we need to taste a terrine? Maybe not, but let's look at what's relevant. Let's look at the target student in an educational institution. Let's look at the target employer when they graduate. You know, are these, are these culinary students and hospitality students going to be chefs or product developers? They can be food stylists. They can be food writers. They can be foodpreneurs and start their own company. They can be sommeliers or restaurateurs, restaurant um, uh, reviewers. They can do so many things that maybe you or I didn't have when we started out to think about being in this industry. So looking at the curriculum is key. So what are you teaching and what are you setting up these students for in the future? What will they need to know? What, how can you put them ahead of other graduates from other culinary schools? Um, one, one of the things like yesterday, I met with uh, representatives from uh, Glion and Les Roches, um, Ducasse, Ecole Ducasse in France. Mm. So one of the plans that uh, you know, Christine and I wanna do is, is try to take the expertise, both in the curriculum and the instruction as well as the operations of culinary and hospitality schools across Canada, across the US, Malaysia, Indonesia, Vietnam, China, Europe, and try to just basically steal ideas and share ideas. And I think there's so many ways we can take, um, I think that the benefits and the skills and the abilities that are done here and share them here. And by doing that, the industry is the, uh, is the one that's gonna benefit and individuals and schools, as well as ultimately the end consumer. Well, the international part of it is a is a key touch point. I mean, you and you and I know firsthand what it's like uh, working with uh, seventy mainland Chinese students whose English level is very it, it isn't exactly uh, top notch. Um, they're maybe not necessarily understanding material. There's what are what are some things that that you guys are prepared to do to come in and work with colleges to help them kind of overcome these things. I think one of the, sorry, go ahead, Christine. One of the things we want to do is to start with an evaluation. The what's working, what's not working, what's missing. We're not saying we're going to come in and overhaul everything because the school can be doing fabulous things, but how to build on that and how to plan for the future. And for me, I, I would say the first thing I, I've got uh, years and years of experience in international ed. The first thing I would say is that I'm incredibly impressed with the bravery of students from wherever they're coming from, whether it's mainland China or again, you know, Vietnam um, 
and, and coming to a different country, a different culture, different language. I know one time I was left alone without my guide for about 30 seconds in Chongqing and I got lost. Um, <laughs> so, you know, someone to be in a different country and a different culture and, and using a different language, they have my greatest respect to begin with. So for us, it's a matter of understanding the different cultures, um, showing you care. I think that once you know, once people know that you care and you're willing to roll up your sleeves and work hard with them to improve, um, uh, you know, their, their skill set, um, they're willing to, you know, to help you and, and work closely with you. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, the, it's, that, it's that personal connection. And, and that's what hospitality is all about, is the personal connection. Yeah, um, I, mean, I can remember working with students in rural Vietnam where you're looking at the, the place that these students are coming from and then imagine them in downtown Calgary or downtown Toronto or Vancouver. It's a completely different world. Right. Um, I was working with two students from rural China and uh, both of the girls work in the hospitality industry in, in Toronto but they have to stay together because they don't have the confidence to go somewhere alone. Mm -hmm. So that kind of bravery really impresses me. And, and um, you know, I, I would love to be able to work with them as students, as well as the faculty to be able to help and assist. Are you seeing um, the, as we, we talked just a moment ago about the, the kind of the, the almost the, the end user here where students are going into the industry and the industry uh, is is either offering jobs or or accepting their qualifications. Um, is it, what I see a lot of times is there's kind of a stigma against uh, either either people who have gone and gotten their red seal. Maybe they're the the uh, operator feels that they're either too qualified, or maybe they haven't learned um, the the skills that they're going to want to use. So how how are you? working with the schools and saying, well, you're teaching this, but this is really what the employer is looking for. You know, it's really looking at the whole curriculum. So it's not only teaching the basics and the foundations, how to make a stock, how to make a souffle, how to, you know, how to, how to roast something, but it's thinking about where you're going to use it. So in that way, as part of the learning, we'll be bringing in experts. So if you're thinking about wanting to understand how to season something, let's bring in someone who's an expert in salt and have them do a lecture and a demo and a taste. Or if you're thinking about wanting to study more of Italian pasta, well, great, let's bring in a little Nona who knows so much about Italian pasta and do a demo and do a lecture. And that's a memory that those students will have forever. That's teaching them above and beyond what's in a textbook or above and beyond what could just be served day to day. It expands their investigation and their knowledge and externally focuses them on the whole industry to see what's happening you know really setting them up for it's a career not just a job so i, I would say that one person or, or two of us in, in a partnership you know can't contain all the information you need to share and that's where the power of consultation comes in and bringing in the experts that christine has contacts with um, we talked the other day about maybe bringing in people in business um, we talked about a, a fellow we know that started a restaurant and rather than buy the building put all the money and the time and energy into the restaurant the building is now worth 4.5 million. The restaurant might be worth, a, you know, a considerable sum of money, but certainly not 4.5 million. So right. maybe by bringing in people that can teach about marketing, that can teach about accounting, digital marketing, um, it might not be us that are the experts, but we can facilitate that and um, hopefully improve that uh, that business ultimately the end result. But um, that's one example. Are you seeing where schools are are either, maybe there's room for improvement here, but where they are teaching young and aspiring chefs the business as well, because a, a, a lot of a lot of chefs come out of school and they're they're going to be the next greatest Food Network star, but they don't know how to run the business. And they you're go. You're so right. Oh, Jason, you are so right. We aren't training people to be executive chefs. We're training people to be cooks in this industry. Right. But that doesn't set them up for growing in their career. When they get a promotion to executive chef, what are they to do if they haven't been taught the business of running a restaurant or the business of running a kitchen? Yes, culinary schools often start in the basics, but let's add to that. This is a whole different world today. It's a whole different industry. We've all heard the stories of, of the hardship in finding kitchen staff, in finding wait staff. So let's make sure those graduates that are coming out of culinary schools, wherever they are around the world, are 
the shining stars that are set up for success that you know really have the experience and the introductions behind them to go forward so and again from my end of things on this partnership is focusing on uh, the education as well as the operations of the school um, working with the faculty to improve the instruction working with christine and experts around the world to make sure that the curriculum is relevant you and i talked the other day about some of the the um you know the curriculum that involves technology that's 20 years old why are we teaching students about technology that's 20 years old? Right. Um, we've talked about the idea of looking at resources, online resources. I worked with a, an expert, uh, an award-winning writer who was a college instructor, Jeremy Cato, who pulled in five or six different resources all online to complement his instruction rather than hand someone a textbook that's 10 years old and say, this is the course. Let's just pause for a second and say that we love Jeremy. He's... Yes. he's Awesome. I hope he's not watching. He, he, he's gone out. Is, <laughs> is Jerry, and, and, and to speak to, to Jerry just for a second, this is a, a, an example of, of um, somebody who really does take the opportunity to pull in to make sure that the right thing is getting taught and takes the research and putting into the lessons. It's not the same uh, diatribe every day, every day, every day, where sometimes instructors get into that I've, I've, I've taught this a hundred times. I'm just going to sing the same song and then I'm going to send you at the door. I can remember, I, I don't want to repeat this to too many students, but I remember doing my master's and the teacher was so boring. I had many that were great, but this teacher was so boring in the middle of the lecture. I walked over to the side of the room, opened the window and backed up like I was going to jump out the window. <laughs> I was a little younger in those days, but in many times I felt like that in lectures, but someone standing there with a PowerPoint reading it for an hour and a half, I'd like to shoot myself in the foot and you know claim I was hurt. <laughs> but people like yourself and people like Jeremy understand the importance of enhancing the uh, the instruction and making it dynamic and exciting and and uh, that's you know I think that's one part of what we're about here is, is uh, making sure we focus on the instruction in a culinary school and a hospitality school to make that the best it can be to send those students on to uh, to greatness. And really okay. when we're thinking about the future we're not thinking about the students in the country that they're in. We're thinking about the culinary world being worldwide. So let's look farther than just the country that the students are in. Let's look for examples in other countries. Sure, there's lots of room for improvement, but let's borrow with pride some really great things that are being done in other culinary schools around the world. Let's line up those meetings so we can have uh, visits and stages and experiences and uh, the opportunities for students to visit different great culinary and hospitality schools around the world. That's an excellent point and I, I, I'll give a shout out to, to the chef that I trained under Hans Myers uh, who said when he was one of the founders of Holland College uh, program and he said on Prince Edward Island everybody thought that they put this, this school there for culinary arts that they were going to get all of the all the students and he said no none of them are coming to work with you. We're sending them to New York, we're sending them to Paris, we're sending them to Toronto and Vancouver and Chicago and Miami so that they can go and actually learn something outside of boiling potatoes and cooking fish at the time. And then they would come back possibly and bring those culinary flavors and inspirations to the region, which again is, is thinking more on a global scale. It's funny. And isn't that all about the melting pot of culinary, putting right. all the flavors together, sharing food around the table, you know, it, that's what we all do this for. I, Jace, I don't know if I told this story, you might have uh, heard it before, but it was about a student doing a co-op. He happened to be from China and he was quite shy and his language wasn't um, perfect. And he was on a co-op in a hotel and he found it quite difficult because it was long hours and lots of hard work. And about partway through his co-op, he phoned his grandmother in China and asked her to buy the whole hotel. <laughs> she was capable and rich enough and, and um, thought about it, but left him there to finish his co-op to learn, and then maybe she'll buy the hotel. So sometimes <laughs> we have to be a little careful as that fellow on co-op might be the, uh, the owner and the manager of the hotel rather quickly. I may have taught that guy. <laughs> <laughs> you probably taught him to phone home. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> Chef, as a as a, a, a culinary trendologist, where do you see things going right now? I mean, uh, I, I make fun of terrines all the time, but where, where are you seeing uh, food trends going? I mean, and, and a better question is, so where are you making food trends go? Because you're the person doing this. 
Thank you, Chef. You know, I think right now the culinary world, whether it be retail, whether it be food service, wherever we look, we know more than we ever have before. Our clients and our diners know more than they ever have before. So it's an exciting time right now in the food industry. I'm seeing a lot of new flavors. You know, people say to me, what's the difference between a trend and a fad? Well, a trend is something that might be, uh, we want to build upon, we want to put on our menu, we want to develop uh, products around. So there's a lot of great flavors. I look at flavors and cooking uh, equipment and different ethnicities. Certainly the world of bourbon and bourbon as an ingredient is huge right now. Um, I've just come back from a couple of big food shows and bourbon in chocolates, bourbon in barbecue sauces, bourbon as a glaze, um, not just in a glass with ice cubes. Um, the world of hot sauce is literally on fire and exploding. Great new flavor, not just heat. Um, the like. plant-based, you know, plant-based, we all talk about it. It's neither a trend nor a fad. It is a part of our food industry that we will always have right now. I love the fact that plant-based focuses on what it includes rather than what it excludes. Mm -hmm. And so we talk about the variety and the innovation around plant-based meals. Um, it's huge. It's absolutely looking to details from ethnicities, not just saying this is a sauce from France, but this is a sauce from Lyon, or not just saying uh, that this is a mole from Mexico, but this could come from Telchacuerto in Mexico. And so those kind of things and those kind of external observations are fabulous to bring into a culinary school. Culinary students standing around learning about that from experts or, or visiting chefs or vi visiting manufacturers or ingredient houses, that would be extraordinarily great way to spend a day at school. You just make my mouth water every time you speak. <laughs> and, and this is why I was so excited to have you on. It, David, and, and where are you seeing changes? I mean, I know we talked about technology, but what are some of the things that, that you think are, 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 there's also, there's room for improvement, but you see, but, but where are you seeing kind of the curve going with, with uh, kind of the way things we've always done it? Well, I think, you know, that old expression, you continue to do the way, you know, do the things you've always done, you're going to get the same results. And I, you know, I think they, you know, the trend in education many years ago, I'm way older than you, Jason, but um, I would be described as an auditory learner. I would sit in a classroom in straight rows of five and there'd be, you know, 30 or 35 students in the class. The teacher would talk. And I think of, uh, you know, the Charlie Brown comics where, you know, it's kind of a different sound. And uh, my life would be looking to the right where that clock was, waiting for that thing to hit three o'clock so I could get out of there. Right. I think nowadays you're finding more and more students uh, are tactile and uh, you know in, into the touch, taste, and feel, um, not just auditory learners. So visual and tactile. So the, the you know the, the designs of a classroom uh, would be significantly different than when I was in school of five rows of five or you know six rows of six or whatever the case may be. You know, now you find the structure of a classroom, it's much more interactive. You're providing experiences. Uh, you're providing field experiences. Again, what I've seen with Christine is, is tapping into the experts um, in the industry to come into the classroom. Um, we talked the other day about even in the NBA, someone could be a, an amazing basketball player, but they still have a, um, uh, a shooting coach. Right. Someone I, I think of, I watched the hockey game the other day, and you know, you and I are in different towns, but I, I love the Canucks and, uh, you know, the, the Canucks goalie has a goalie coach. So that instructor, a great instructor like you in a college, there's nothing wrong with bringing in an expert to talk about, you know, a particular um, uh, trend or, uh, you know, a particular technique uh, or business or account, whatever the case may be, it just adds to that experience. So getting field experiences, you can talk about a hotel for two classes. Why don't you just, which you've done, and many of the instructors we worked with, with some encouragement and, and releasing them. I remember the, the one teacher saying, you think I can do that? Sure, go. And you know they're gonna touch, taste and feel far more in that experience than sitting in a classroom listening to someone read a PowerPoint. And I love, just do I it. love Dave's example of touch, taste and feel because that's yeah. all about food. So taking students on in-store at market tours to where the tastes and trends are happening, walking a gourmet store, walking a grocery store, walking through a market, giving them a challenge, going out and finding new flavors, bringing them back in and having a cooking challenge. That's, that's awesome. Even going out and sourcing product, you know, hit the, hit the market. 
go and 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 feel and touch and taste and sample and all of those things it, it whether re, regardless of what position within the hospitality industry too that's not just somebody behind the line but somebody who's serving or somebody who's bartending or even somebody who's managing go and go and become a part of the world we we uh if we just hang out with the same people all of the time and we only limit where we can where we can go the coolest thing about this industry i have found in in over 30 years has been that i get to learn something new every day so being a lifelong learner it's been my my distinct pleasure to to get the opportunity to talk with and learn from and taste and all of that thing so i get super excited about it and i like to encourage that and then, and i think anybody who has the opportunity to um, work with your your new collaboration is as an absolute privilege and an honor to to get that inspiration from you both. You know, I was thinking from the hospitality end of things uh, on the touch, taste and feel, my brother runs a very large ski hill and has been in the hospitality and the ski industry for his whole life. And one of the things he does with 800 employees, you know, as the vice president, he doesn't have to get there till whatever hour he wishes, but he often gets there at six in the morning and shakes hands with every single employee going up the gondola. That's human resources. When you actually, you know, uh, sing the song, um, and get down on the ground, in the cold, in the wind, shake hands with every single employee. Those employees are the ones that are gonna make the difference every single day. And that's the way we look at the way the schools operate is those instructors are gonna make the difference with those students. Those students are gonna make the difference in the industry. So high expectations, um, teaching everything from current curriculum to human resources to not only the, the skills and abilities within the kitchen, but the management end of things as well so that we can train experts. Yeah, I'll borrow a line from you, Chef, when you said it's a difference between line cooks and leaders. Right. Because it is. We, we can train anyone to be a line cook within reason, but to be a leader in this industry that we all care about. We're all passionate about the food and hospitality industry. That's why we do what we do. That's, uh, that, that's, that's been, I think, is a, is a downfall in being able to pass education on and pass skills on as well to if we're, if we're putting out people who are, are proud of what they do, are um, interested in sharing that knowledge uh, on the line, uh, sharing it with their guests, being evangelists about what we do, then, then we're going to create a different dynamic within the hospitality industry rather than, um, in the, rather than dipping into the dark side of it where, where we end up with problems, where we have people who are struggling, who, who go into a place where they just come in every day and they do that one thing and they work that one station and they go home. Um, and that's, that, that's, that's gone on the wrong track in a lot of ways, which is why we have to, in, in many cases, now we're talking about mental health in, in kitchens. Absolutely. And isn't that interesting? We never had to think about that before or, or it existed, but we didn't talk about that before. Well, yeah, we just didn't write, we didn't talk about it. So there was, there was, there was, um, there was a time for a long time where we were just bringing warm bodies in and saying, you know, this is your, this is your station. These are your six dishes or 10 dishes that you need to know how to make and pump out of your station. And that's it. Mm -hmm. And uh, you show up 15 minutes before your shift. And what you do after your shift is your own business. And we don't want to hear about it. And if you don't show up tomorrow, well, there's another resume. Exactly. But, you know, think about the leaders in the culinary world right now. Um, whether it be culinary or hospitality, think about chefs and restaurateurs like Thomas Keller. Thomas Keller is an example, a great example. He is all about taste. He's all about creating food memories. Food memories are huge for him. But he's also about inspiring and mentoring and guiding anyone in the front of house or back of house at any of his restaurants. And he's doing that to set up the next generation. We are lucky to have Thomas Keller right now, but Thomas Keller will not always be around for us. So he's setting up the next generation and he's really training them. He's, he's instilling the history of Escoffier and the, and, and the teachings of Paul Bocuse, but he's also creating it with the garden across the street from the French Laundry, where you know where your food comes from, where you're talking to the farmer, whether, when if you want a certain kind of squash, you talk to the farmer and it'll be there, and challenging his, his staff and his aides to create something with that food. Well, imagine transferring some of, just some of those lessons into a culinary school classroom extraordinary things would happen well there and and we talk about chef keller that's uh that he he is an icon for all of the reasons why you say and it's not about one dish that he makes 
it's it's because of all of those things and we can we can create that within the industry by coming right back into the right back into the classroom right into the line right into the culinary arts program and starting there and so much of what we're talking about is from the chef point of view but then we bring in dave the expert on the educational teaching. So we know what we might want to have there with food wise, but now here's Dave and he can go and talk to the chef faculty about how to teach that. Right. That's not being done. We can't wait to share this. Right. Dave, you, I know you're dying to speak. When you said you were going to bring in an expert, I was waiting for who, who you were going to bring in there. And then you mentioned me. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, 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 and that's the thing, like, like chef just mentioned is, is that's not there. And, and it's not there because it's it, because it's somebody's fault. It's there because it, that hasn't been the approach taken. No, right? we said the other day, I think the majority of people are just left alone and there's expectations. But I think you get results by having the expectations, but you've got to put some effort and energy into that. And I think it starts with caring and listening. Um, I mentioned, uh, I was working with a college the other day and I give them full credit. It was just dialogue around uh, curriculum but they've added things like um, um, uh, sustainable foraging, uh, sustainable fisheries. So imagine, you know, taking a couple of ideas and curriculum from this college, one from Malaysia, one from Italy, and then combining that and be able to share that around the world. It's not that one person has the answer. The creativity uh, and the thoughts uh, around improvement around the world are absolutely staggering. Um, you know, I've been in schools from Chile to China uh, and uh, in many places in between. Uh, and the resources that some of the teachers have are, are wonderful. The resources that others have are, are you know, embarrassing, but they make the difference. It's the quality of instruction. But I think if you can look at things like enhancing that technology. Now, most people think with technology, well, it's you know, new computers or laptops or, but I've seen some amazing teaching you know, for just from an iPad, which isn't new, um, using different colors, you know, how the brain registers uh, different colors and learns better um, by using different text and different text size, ensuring the students are, you know, rewriting and retyping. Again, I think the brain registers about 17% better on memory if they do that. Um, Christine and I were working with a staff the other day about having a camera on a gooseneck, uh, a gooseneck um, device so that you can have the camera go right close to, you know, what was happening in that, um, in that uh, uh, cake decorating class. For me, I got the idea from a, a machine shop I was in where they had the exact same thing, teaching students how to use a lathe. But you can't get the student's face right up to the lathe or they won't have a face for very long. <laughs> That's, and again, being, having your resources to be able to, to pull from all of these global experiences and, and, and showing what works, not only to, to educators, but to institutions is so beneficial. That's, That's so, so this is a, a, a new collaboration that, uh, and, and the website is up now. It's a great collaboration that makes both of us smile. We're so looking forward to, to working together and, and, and meeting so many more people in the industry too. And I'm just gonna check with our producer, Robbie, if there are questions that people are, because we are on, again, LinkedIn Live, we're on YouTube, we're on Periscope. Okay. Yeah, I think so. In the Q and A part. Yeah. Better. Uh, kind of. So the subject of today's cooking podcast is today's culinary free school offering online courses. Tastes and can be definitely involved when the instructor can get hand evaluation. Oh, fantastic! So from Michael Aaron on the subject of taste. What do you think of Escoffia Culinary School offering online courses? Taste isn't exactly involved where the instructor can evaluate, but the technique can be based on pictures and videos through processes of homework assignments. You know, I think it's great. Um, I'm not saying it's the only way to learn, but I think of it as lifelong learning. So if you were already a graduate, if you were already working in a restaurant, if you were already setting up your own catering company or whatever you ended up doing, you could still continue to, as you said, learn all the time. 
um, be updated, go on to Escoffier and, and take an online course. It's, it's like any of us in the industry. We spend time going to trade shows around the world. We spend time meeting other experts and cooking and talking and tasting uh, food together. We're always learning. So doing it online is fine. As long as you remember to bring it back, it is food and, and cook and taste something together. That's awesome. It's, and, and the lifelong learning part of it, I mean, we never stop learning in, in this industry for sure. It's something that um, we aspire to do. And, and I think it's the reason why a lot of us stay. Um, another question by Jeffrey Michael is, it is, essential, is it essential to go to school to learn? I found learning in the field far more beneficial. I've taught young children, adults, cooking classes for a long time in my kitchen without any schooling. Uh, just basic research, any, it, just, I just basically research any culinary aspects of my own time. Is schooling actually beneficial? So I mean, that's kind of a loaded question for people who work with schools, but what are your thoughts on that? Well, I could take a shot at it. First thing I, I think is, is uh, there's probably no doubt in the world that, uh, no doubt uh, in your mind that um, uh, someone can teach and, and they can inspire and they can teach you know, skills and, and you know, culinary skills. Uh, maybe they haven't had uh, you know, any formal education, but maybe uh, some formal education, whatever it may be, whether it's an online course or you know, a weekend course or a full enrollment in a you know, diploma or certificate, you know, is there a chance that that will enhance what you're doing? And enhance your knowledge base. Um, I remember one uh, one ab Aboriginal student I taught, and he was a, a wonderful uh, motivator for me. And uh, his comment was, "Just because you've taught it once, don't think I've learned it." So sometimes people take uh, and they learn differently. They might take two or three times. They might take a video. They might take an online. They might read the book, um, but they learn differently. And so my my comment would be, I'm sure that this person is is a good teacher and has, has changed the lives of many people. Um, but the question would be, maybe enrolling in that course, you know, would that enhance that ability to instruct? And you know, I would say in many cases, even just watching teachers, I've picked up so many things in terms of what I wouldn't do and what I would do. Um, right. That's my comment. I am, am my, my own answer is I feel like the basic structure of actually going and learning in in a school setting, uh, even, even just to learn the basics, that carries a lot in, um, in having that core knowledge when you do go into the field and when you do go into, uh, into kitchens or into restaurants, um, you you've, you've been introduced to some of that um, in what do I do here or even just learning basic systems that's, uh, that, that may not be carried in if you happen to go into an independent restaurant, not a big corporation that has these things in place where they're gonna teach you anyway. I also think there's probably you know, many, many, many of us that have learned from parents and grandparents uh, and, and brothers and uncles about all sorts of different aspects uh, of the world. And none of, none of those people may have been trained as, as educators. So for me, I learned you know, an incredible worth eth work ethic from my father. He hadn't had any training as an instructor but I learned a great deal. So I'm sure there's many people that are just teaching uh, all sorts of different skill sets uh, and are, are great role models. But the question would be, will it be enhanced by taking that course? And we know that on the job training is fantastic. You can have your background in culinary school and hospitality school, but when it's you know five to six and the doors being unlocked at six o'clock and the rush of guests and customers are there and something's not ready, the only way you learn is jumping in as a team and doing it. So that's not only in the back of house. Think about the hospitality front of the house examples, you know, uh, of of everyone coming in or a problem with the reservation book or the wines not being chilled or, you know, all of those things um, on the job training is invaluable at the same time. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think, I think, uh, I think a, a, a bit of both um, goes a long way and, and approaching it in the way that um, you two are approaching it. Uh, I think it's going to change the way that the industry thinks about schooling in general. Because again, that changes the way that we teach. It changes the way that the uh, the cooks are coming out, the, how more prepared they are, and even more even more socially prepared they are. 
Right. And don't forget, it's not only about the cooks, because we're also thinking about the, the front end of the house, too. Right. So thinking about the hospitality side of it yeah. and thinking about the leaders that we should bring in to um, inspire the hospitality side of courses and the wine side of courses and the sommeliers that could come in and do tastings. Uh, you know, we've all had examples of going to dinner in a restaurant and knowing being served by a professional because they just have it down the way they welcome you the way they serve the way they describe the food and and those are memories too not just memories of the flavors christine oh, yeah. calls it boring with pride i think i call it stealing with energy but every every time i quote that i throw a new term on there it's dealing with something but imagine borrowing stealing or learning the ideas from culinary and hospitality schools around the world and just picking up those techniques and being able to bring them into your school or your college. Um, there's got to be one or two things in there that are going to enhance the instruction, that are going to enhance the school and enhance the students. Um, so I also want to think about <laughs> not just culinary students who are starting off their career or hospitality students starting off their career, but think about people who've had a change in their career, more mature students who have decided that maybe they want to find a home in the culinary and hospitality industry. So we have to also think about the culinary faculty and the hospitality faculty and how they would teach a more mature student and, and what a mature student would be able to bring to their class, their life experiences, their, their flavor experiences, their ethnic experiences potentially from wherever they come from. I think that working together to make sure that that combination is there is really important. I think recognizing the skills that people come with is is big when you talk about somebody who's mature and been in the industry as well. Um, I did some work years ago with the Canadian Tour Canadian Tourism Human Resource Council, where they have a uh, a line cooks certification, where you where they go through a testing, they go through a uh, uh, an observation to to get that to recognize them for basic skill sets and. It's, uh, it's been designed by, uh, by chefs, by the industry. I have yet to see it adopted, but I always thought it was a great idea to, 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 to just to give that confidence and to give some recognition that, that, yes, these people come with this toolkit that they've learned in 20 years, 30 years of being in the industry. They may not be a red seal. Maybe they didn't go to a, a high profile school. Maybe they started when they were 15 and just stayed on in. And uh, this is, it's a, it was an excellent way, and I believe the program still exists, it's an excellent way to recognize those skills. I love that, to measure the skills of what you already have. It's fantastic. Yeah. You know, another aspect that we haven't really touched on today that's important in the business of running a culinary school is how to work well with your alumni, how to set up um, an opportunity for restaurateurs, whether it be large change or independent restaurants, to really think about getting these students on stages or or how they can become their employees you know quite often it's you're finished you're done um, i was in um san francisco recently and speaking to a wonderful chef and restaurateur who said you know i'm so surprised i i really didn't ever hear back after i graduated well that's a lost opportunity so we talk about bringing in our experts in the field and our and our connections in the industry this is what we would also like to do to show that this is part of the business of running a culinary school right and david you had you were going to chime in there yeah that was about seven seconds ago jason i think i forgot my my thought but thanks for <laughs> embarrassing me in front of hundreds of people thousands actually but yeah good you're, you're doing fine buddy no my my comment was i i've worked with and christine has uh uh, many students that have entered the culinary and hospitality world, in some cases that were accountants or engineers that have said, listen, that's not the career for me and good for them. They, you know, it's brave to make a decision when you're 35 or 40 with two kids and you're looking to change your career. Um, but yeah, I think you have to recognize the difference in the students. And, um, you know, obviously you're going to um, try to, to um, build on their strengths, but at the same time, tap into the strengths and the energy and the experience they've got to be able to share with other people around them. So you've got to I remember one student was about a 35 year old engineer and you had students in that class that were 19. He had a lot to be able to share with those students about life and learning. Uh, and you develop that, I think, I use the term a sense of climate within a classroom, a sense of climate within a, within a school. And you know that positive climate, I think, can enhance the learning significantly. That's, you touched on a point that I'm in, I, I don't know how many umpteen chef groups on social media and whatnot. And, Many, many, many people are um, kind of at the end of their at the end of their knees and back and hips, 
let's just say from working in, working in the industry and are making decisions now as to what, what am I gonna do now? There's opportunity there for them to share knowledge, but there's there are few places for them to go and do it. And a lot of them find themselves lost in knowing where to go. What are, you, what are your thoughts on that, Chef? They are, you know what? Um, that just sort of, that tells me that we're not doing a good job about showcasing the opportunities that are out there. Many people when they've entered into culinary school might think, uh, I'm going to be the executive chef at a hotel. I'm going to run a restaurant. I'm going to be on the Food Network. And we all aren't going to be. So I really think that we have to spend more time showing and bringing examples of what there is out there in the industry. Yeah, I, and my, my comment oftentimes is, is take the opportunity to share what you know. Mm -hmm. um, whether, whether that's um, approaching the local school or working with local restaurants or working with uh, producers and farmers and, and, and whatnot and becoming a, a, um, a conduit and, and sharing that knowledge. That's um, because again, like I say, we, we get to a point where we don't necessarily know or they're, they're getting to a point where they don't necessarily know what to do now. And retirement's not in the books because they have, because they, they're not retiring from a high-end hotel where, right. where they're getting the package, right? They're walking out the door and that's the last they see them. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So giving them, you know, we talked about lifelong, what have they learned for, through their career and maybe they want to make up a change and could they come back and be part of not just a basic cooking class at a cooking school, but could cooking schools start to offer the experience and the upgrades partway through a career or toward the end of a career that someone may need. Right. What a, what an opportunity to, to bring these people back and, and maybe bring them into a, a, a culinary teaching program. Exactly. Exactly. Another option, Jason, is, is through some of the connections that Christine and I have developed is sometimes students don't think out of the box is uh, you look at the opportunity to pick up a business degree or a hospitality degree uh, in some of the top uh, universities in the world doesn't necessarily have to be right next door um, is an opportunity as well. And some people don't even think about that. They don't have the connections, but the opportunity to come out with a, with a bachelor's degree in, in hospitality and business gives you that opportunity maybe to grow your career uh, and, and step into a different aspect of hospitality and culinary. That's where distance learning comes in too, right? That's a great opportunity to be able to do that. You don't have to miss, maybe necessarily leave Swift Current Saskatchewan to get your degree. Yeah, or in some ways. maybe you leave for 11 weeks. Uh, you don't have to leave for five and a half years. Right, right. That's right. certainly when we think of the whole operations of a school is something that we would come in and evaluate. And Dave is incredible with these kind of connections and thinking about the connections to other schools where you could go and spend some time get a different part of your degree and still come back. I have to write down the things that Dave's good at when Christina is praising me. <laughs> okay. And I think we have another question here. Okay. It's always nice. I remember as a teacher teaching for 60 minutes, asking the class if there's any questions and no one raises their hand. <laughs> they just want to get out the door. Uh, Robbie, this one here, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, okay. All right. Um, John Patton is asking, what is the best online platform for independent restaurants using training, you, you, to use for training today's culinary employees? So I'll, I'll read it again, because I kind of stumbled there. What is the best online platform for independent restaurants to use for training today's culinary employees? What are your thoughts on that? Christine, the last school we were in together, they had access to a online, but uh, I'm trying to remember the name of that particular one. You know, I think that there's a lot of them out there. And I think that um, certainly we know that the Culinary Institute of America does have some of those kind of courses. Certainly the Food Business School also has some of those online courses in thinking about where to go when you graduate. I don't know if there's one that would be a match to everyone. I think, again, when we think about who are the target students, who are the target potential future employers, uh, we have to really think about what would make sense. But it would be interesting as an independent restaurant to line up a partnership 
with a culinary school. And this is some of the things we can facilitate if we can help in any way to customizing a course for an independent restaurant or an independent restaurant group to be able to say, this is what our chefs know. This is what we want them to know. And so we can be that facilitator. We can be able to talk to the schools in their area, to line up a culinary school with them and to devise a curriculum that's just for those independent restaurants. We can work around the time that they have. Maybe they come in every Thursday from eight till 10 in the morning for 20 weeks instead of having to be in school every day, all day. Plus there's the opportunity, as you know, to buy an online license and then have access for all of the students to, to have access to that particular site. Um, you know, it doesn't always have to be that you come to class and then learn. Uh, the teacher can be facilitating the opportunity for students to learn. Um, and that, uh, that works ex extremely well. I like the, uh, I, I like his, his, his question in that it, it, it shows a, a want to continue the education. And what you said, Chef, is to, to be able to still have the, uh, the schools involved in the community in such a way where we're still teaching, we're still here as a resource where it's not just we've given, we've, we've, we've anointed you and out the door, right? And we don't, and we're not, uh, we're not interested in educating the community. I think that is, uh, is fantastic to be able to, to connect in that way. I think it's also an incentive. I mean, if it was an independent restaurant who wanted their uh, front of house or back of house staff to be upgraded and taught something. That's an incentive for those employees to stay with that company and not leave. How cool would it be to be able to have um, access to be able to, even if you're doing a menu change and saying, you know, we, we've, we've kind of tried this in-house or, or uh, we've, we're looking at maybe going this way, but we have no idea how to make that. We want to, but we have no idea how to, how to go into that genre, um, maybe to approach the school or have the school have something available in that way. Exactly. Uh, I know that um, uh, Vancouver Community College, for example, they've got a, an Italian food program and you can, you can pop in and learn how to make Italian food, everything from pizza to pasta to, to, to whatever. And, and you can hop in as, a, as anybody from the community to be able to do that, but they've opened the doors to be able to do that. And that's the only time I've ever, I've ever heard of that opportunity where somebody off the street who's not an enrolled student can come in and learn that particular thing. Well, I love the fact about we're talking about inspiration, aren't we? We're talking about um, restaurants sending their staff or wanting their staff to know more, to be inspired, to be able to create new menus, create new wine lists, um, really change up reasons for the public coming to love their restaurant, not just the same menus all the time. Right. Um, Robbie, Peter's got some questions on there and I can't open them. I'm, I know that he's, he's asking. And hi, Peter, I see you. I, I can't open your questions though. Okay, I'll leave her with that. Uh, I, I want an opportunity to, is there, to get people have access to you. <laughs> so um, you're both British Columbia based, but available to work with schools around the world. Um, and, and how are you, um, how are you connecting in that way? Are, are you are you are you lined up to go to uh, to South Asia? Are you lined up to to work in the U.S. right now? I know that you've uh, you've been getting a lot of sunshine lately, Chef. When <laughs> <laughs> I have, I'm not going to complain. My <laughs> I won't complain about my sunshine lately. No, and the sunshine hasn't been in British Columbia. <laughs> no. No, I was just there last week. <laughs> it wasn't there. <laughs> no, it's not here. Certainly, you know, one of the first things would be for anyone who wants to uh, contact us and reach out to us, they can get a hold of us through teachtastelearn.com. And we would set up a, a call. We would find out their needs. We would find out what they were looking for. And we would come and meet them in person. You know, you, it's we're talking about food again. You can't just decide whether a solution would be appropriate unless we're really there uh, to come and evaluate and to meet them and, and just see what we could do for them. And that could be a short term, it could be an ongoing consultation, but what it does is it saves that, uh, that college or that school from hiring someone full time where you can bring in uh, you know, the two of us and share some ideas, explore uh, opportunities, uh, listen and learn and then share ideas um, and on, on how to improve. Um, right. Even after, you know, maybe we're, maybe we're with a college for uh, a few months and, and we've got things underway, 
we would be able to come back from time to time and do an evaluation and a reevaluation. How's it working out? Do you want to tweak it a little bit? You know, keeping them up to date of potential connections, potential, we talked about guest experts coming in. Once we get to know our, our clients, they become part of our community, so to speak. And we would be able to keep them updated on things that are happening. It's far, far more cost effective, as you know. I mean, everyone's worried uh, in every stage uh, in terms of the, uh, you know, the return on, on investment and, and you know, how, how is this going to impact uh, their school? But at the same time, you don't, as I said, you don't have to hire someone or three people uh, in three different areas full time to be able to enhance uh, the operation. Well, I know from hands-on experience and personal experience in working with you, David, that uh, even even just even to spend a day and talking about um, things that other people haven't thought about yet, and approaches to teaching that other people haven't thought about yet, even even just to plant that seed in a in a day or two or three, to to show new ideas that where 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 no new ideas have been present for decades, there that that is unbelievably beneficial even even our conversation about chunking lessons and things like that I mean that was that was something I never learned in in, in getting a, an education degree and I think uh, you know I'm always impressed by the power of consultation uh, the opportunity for people to collaborate but look at new ideas but at the same time you've got to have some new ideas to bring and um, to and then the willingness I think once people know you a little bit and they trust you and they know you care then they're willing to try new things and right. it's not brain surgery when you, you know, when you don't want to hear your brain surgeon say, oops, uh, when you're in a classroom and you make a mistake and you've followed a lesson for 15 minutes and you're kind of recognizing, hey, this isn't going so well, you know, you go back and you try again, you try new ideas. And it doesn't take that brain surgeon to recognize the look on those students face, whatever age they are, from 19 to 45, um, you know, they're, uh, when lessons go and they're really moving along as a teacher, you know it. And uh, it's exciting to see that. Uh, that light bulb go off and also the feedback afterwards in collaboration sessions. So it's, um, it's been fun. And, and this has been, you know, from here, Christine and I connected, you know, right away and rolled up our sleeves and started working and immediately thought, you know, we just don't want to be in a position where we're not working together again. And, you know, most of the time, you know, there's, there's laughter and sometimes to a point where I had no air left in and there was tears coming down. Um, and that's, that's great when you can be in a school and, and have that, um, that opportunity, it, it, it's, it's fun. Fantastic. The, well, like I say, that now now the world has the opportunity to to bring the both of you to work with them. Um, that's that's rare, and it's uh, and it's exciting to to see what's going to happen with schools. What happens with uh, with having you outside outside of being tied to a particular institution? So to be able to share with the global community your knowledge and your inspiration and your education and all of that. Um, we are, we've got lots of, had lots of questions, uh, amazing conversation with having you both on. It's my absolute honor to, to have you both. Um, Christine, I get all emotional because I get, <laughs> I, 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 I'm like a big fan, right? It's like, sign this, sign this. Yeah. <laughs> it's so nice to have spent some time with you and to be able to share our passion back and forth. And that's what makes this just a conversation um, of people in the industry, which couldn't imagine a better way to spend the morning. It, 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 Robbie's cheering in the background. Yay! <laughs> well, uh, today my guests have been uh, Chef Christine Cuvelier and my good friend David Durpak. Uh, their new company is called Culinary and Hospitality Leadership Consulting, and they're available to work around the globe to inspire and teach and to collaborate and to take a look at um, how your institution is working in teaching the today's uh, generation and becoming the next generation of hospitality professionals. Uh, we've been live on LinkedIn. We've been live on YouTube. Uh, if you're watching us on YouTube, subscribe, hit the bell and do all of those things so that you can see our videos next when they come up. Also, we're on Periscope Worldwide. Thank you so much to my guests today for your time, for your inspiration and, uh, it's been an honor. Always a pleasure to talk to you, Jason. You as well, David. And thank and you. Too. Bye. Have a good day. Take care.